The land that is Maine was tribal long before white settlers got here. It first belonged to four native tribes, the Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq tribes, which all fall under the umbrella of the Wabanaki Nation. 40 plus years ago, the Maine Indian Claim Settlement Act was signed into law, but the conversations surrounding the Wabanaki Nation and its future are far from over. So what is the act? What is it supposed to do? And are members of the tribes satisfied all these years later? Tonight, we are taking a closer look. October 10th, 1980. A day that would change the relationship between Maine and the Wabanaki nations forever as President Jimmy Carter signed a document called the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act. The act came after a long legal battle between the state of Maine and two of the Wabanaki Nation's tribes, the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot Nation. At the time, the tribes claimed 12 million acres, or nearly two thirds of the state of Maine, belonged to them, and they said they had proof. A judge agreed with them. The ruling forced the state and the tribes to work together and reach a settlement agreement to be approved by Congress. The agreement would give the tribes $81.5 million in reparation for land taken from them. A sister law passed by the Maine Legislature, the Maine Implementing Act, would determine how those assets would be distributed to the tribes and would also require them to follow Maine law. Maine's governor and the legislature viewed the outcome as a huge win. But the agreement and that photo mean something entirely different to some members of the Wabanaki nations, even all these years later. I would explain it as the biggest piece of fraud in Maine's history, and maybe even the country's history. At that time, it was a big, big deal for our tribal communities. As it turns out, uh, the written words in the document didn't accurately capture the spirit and intent of the agreement, in my opinion. I think people have been promised, maybe incorrectly, that even if things were a little bit off, that it was t fixable, like that it could be the first draft of something. Donna Loring, Darren Ranko, and Maria Gerard, all members of the Penobscot Nation, have spent hours combing through the settlement and its history. They believe that for the Wabanaki people, the act had the unintended and unwanted effect of taking away the tribe's sovereignty. Sovereignty is defined as having supreme power or authority as a self-governing state. And while the act was written in a way that allowed the tribes to go back and make amendments as needed, they say that process didn't work as they expected. There was a lot of hope that this was a beginning of a new relationship that we were going to be, you know, working government to government or um, as equals. And um, it doesn't seem like that came to pass. You know, their vision was always to uh, assimilate the tribes and have the uh, tribal communities become municipalities, you know, political subdivisions of the state, which is how they're interpreting that, that document now. And they're referring to us over and over again as municipalities. When they wrote that claims, they uh, put in that, well, you know, you, if it's changed, then it needs to be an agreement between the tribe and, and the state, uh, because we know that, th that things change over the years, and there may be some gray areas or some gaps. So uh, yeah, we'll leave that door open so that you guys can negotiate and make some changes. Well, what happened was, whenever there was a disagreement, it would go to state court. And who would win that argument? You know, wasn't the tribes. Records show at the time of the agreement, the tribes had been living in extreme poverty. And they were in poverty because the state controlled their access to uh, the economy. In 1976, after receiving federal recognition, some money had begun to flow into the tribes, giving them more control over their economic future. Gerard recalls it was a transformative time for Indian Island. Um, I remember when I was a young girl growing up here on the island, but I saw the changes that happened in our community. 
where we're sitting right now was just a big ball field at the dead end of a road. And everything um, north of here was all built up as infrastructure. The first phase of housing was being developed and it was something so beyond ours. We nicknamed it Hollywood. <laughs> So these new uh, phases of housings that were coming in were like really, you know, nice by our standards and we could see how our community was um, growing and um, having opportunities and just building up. It was like before our eyes. The 1980 Settlement Act signaled another potential shift in economic development for the tribes. With the money they received from the settlement, the tribes made good investments and bad. One of those deals, the purchase of the Dragon Products Company in Thomaston, New England's only cement maker. The tribes sold it to a Massachusetts-based company a few years later. The New York Times said the deal, which sources valued at $80 million, is an example of the increasingly aggressive business posture of American Indian tribes. Another investment the Penobscots had high hopes for, the Sokalexis Ice Arena, which was built on Indian Island in 1984. We had a lot of children that were playing ice hockey, um, and we thought this was a great way to invite people over and to be part, and uh, it didn't pan out that way, but, you know, the arena uh, still stands, and it's been through a couple different um, life spans. It was then the uh, high stakes bingo, and then that became uh, challenged with the uh, casinos um, in, the, in Bangor and some of the, I would say, inequitable uh, gaming laws of the state. So there were a lot of factors. And uh, like Donna said, we didn't know a whole heck of a lot about um, being business owners in the beginning. But, um, you know, we, we did the best we, we could and everything's um, a lesson learned. Donna Loring, Darren Ranko, and Maria Gerard, all members of Penobscot Nation, believe part of why the tribes have had such difficulty moving forward stems from not having full control over their finances and decision-making power. They argue the legislative process back in 1980 had been hurried, and because of that, key details fell through the cracks. Details they believe had the unintended and unwanted effect of taking away the tribe's sovereignty. Unfortunately, we felt so rushed uh, throughout the whole process by looming federal deadlines and the um, presidential elections and, you know, there was so much going on. There was overt racial hostilities in the state of Maine and, you know, all these people were angry at us because we had um, fouled up the real estate market, you know, because nobody could really say who owned the land anymore. Um, you know, there was a lot going on. It's really complicated. Though he's not featured in this photo, well, Tim Woodcock, an see. attorney from Bangor, uh, played a central role in the passing of the Maine so Indian Claim Settlement there. Act. Woodcock was handpicked by then Senator Bill Cohen to become staff director of the Senate's Indian Affairs Committee. Attorney Woodcock argues the tribe's sovereignty remains intact, and a court ruling back in 1830 protected that right. They're still governments, and their governmental authority is not derived from the U.S. Constitution or any state constitution. It's derived from their aboriginal authority as tribal communities. The real question with sovereignty to me is, it's not whether the main tribes are sovereign or not. They are sovereign. The question is, what are the limitations on, the, on their sovereignty? I think that is the crux of some of the contemporary uh, disagreements that are, have become public policy issues, is where are the limits of the tribe's uh, authority now and where ought they to be? The question surrounding sovereignty and the future of the tribes remains unresolved. In fact, some would like to see the act scrapped completely and instead have members of Wabanaki Nation and Maine officials go back to the drawing board. And I believe that the Maine Settlement Act has locked us again into this paternalistic relationship with the state of Maine, a relationship that we don't want. We haven't wanted for a, for a long time. It didn't serve us well, you know, all the years leading up to the land claims. And so, you know, there's nothing that can 
convinced me that anyone um, expected that to continue. And it's almost like the, the land claims um, kept us in, in shackles. We just want to be left alone to, to, to progress and be able to choose our economic future, to choose our educational future, to do what we see fit to do with our lands uh, and our courts and our law enforcement. Some people fear that if the tribes get sovereignty, you know, it, it's going to be horrible. They're going to be able to just do anything uh, and, and trample the next door neighbor's rights and no, that's not the way that we, that, that I see uh, the tribes operating. And uh, you know, I, I think that we would totally be respective and we, and we are of other people's uh, lands and, and uh, um, how they do things. And you know, because we've had it done to us. Well, it doesn't mean that we're gonna turn around and do something like that to them, which, which they fear. The one word that everyone I spoke to for this piece kept coming back to is hope. They all have hope that the Wapanaki Nation and Maine legislators will be able to reach another agreement, particularly around the piece of sovereignty. If you want to learn more, just head to our website or our mobile app.